first of all, um, obviously I'm from the States, and as, as a taxi driver told me the other day, he says, you talk weird. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, I said, there's, there's proper English, which is what you speak, and then there's English, what we speak in the United States, and then there's Southern English, which is where I'm from. And uh, so if I say things today that, like some lady told me she worked in theater, and I was like, well, why are you at this conference? And she was like, no, no, that's the OR. And so if I say something um, that I say that's Southern, uh, at the end just say, Steve, what did you mean by that? Uh, so I might do that. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, we're excited to be here. Um, um, as Adrian said, um, our name is Avadam, and nobody can ever pronounce it right. And everybody goes, why do you, is your name Avadam? And I always take the chance to share with everybody. Um, it means to serve. Um, and our company is all about giving back. Uh, we take our products, not just to save lives in the United States. Uh, we've been there 10 years now, um, hopefully starting soon here. Uh, but we give our products back to uh, third world nations. Uh, it's very, very important for us to affect global health, and that's kind of our why. So our company, we really attract people who that's their passion every day. And so hopefully you'll see that passion come through in what I share with you today. Um, just talking about the what we call the emerging revolution. And so what I want to share with you today, and uh, Jack's going to share a little bit as well. We're going to kind of go back and forth, and hopefully we can get through it in about 30, 35 minutes. Uh, but we're going to share with you the microbiome, uh, the role that it's playing. We're going to look at it a little bit backwards and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, so we're going to talk about the old paradigm. Um, Jackson share about the, the healthy stratum corneum, that outside layer of your skin and its 10 defensive functions that we really haven't been paying too much attention to that's critical to health. Uh, I'm going to share about the revolution considering host immunity, right? We all are concerned about the, the cleanliness of the room and surfaces. Um, uh, the environment, all of those things, but at least in the United States, we really haven't paid too much attention or enough attention to the patient themselves and the role that they're playing. Uh, and then finally, we're going to just go through some of our clinical evidence. Um, it's taken us, you know, everybody, we've been around for 10 years, but it took us seven years to create all the clinical evidence to get to where we could start to really make an impact in the United States and what we're doing. Um, so let's talk about the old paradigm. I love this old guy. Um, but let's talk about what we previously thought. We thought that, and this is a reasonable thought, right? We said pathogens cause infections. Um, if we could kill pathogens, then that would necessarily re uh, result in less infections. And what we're finding out, at least in the United States, uh, we're finding out that's not necessarily true. And what we're gonna share with you today is why that isn't necessarily true. Um, when we put uh, topical antiseptic products, uh, whether it be alcohols or whether it be chlorhexidine for maybe preoperative bathing or uh, chlorhexidine for decolonizing a patient in an ICU. What we're really doing is we're eliminating all the good flora on your skin as well as the bad stuff. And what we do is we actually um, start to reduce what Jack will be sharing with you about some of these 10 defensive functions that we have. So I just want to, and I know this is probably, um, and I get this a lot in the United States and I have where at least three or four years ago, they, they would look at me like, um, as we say in the South, we have three eyeballs. That means that uh, they would look at me really weird when we would start talking about really challenging this old paradigm, but that's what we're gonna do. So let's talk about the consequences of antiseptics. You guys might not know this, but in the United States, the FDA just recently came out in May a year ago, and there's, they're taking all the topical antiseptics that you know of, the alcohols, the gels, the benzoclonin chlorides, all those things, uh, triclosan, they're taking those off the market. I think they will stay on the market, but they will have limited uh, or, or, or different labeling claims. And so here are the four problems that we're having. Number one, uh, did they demonstrate that they're proven effective? Actually, we're finding out a lot of data is showing that when you're doing chlorhexidine bathing before surgery is not reducing infection rates. We're, it's, it's really too much up in the air. Um, do the benefits outweigh the adverse effects? where you're having to use these special lotions and things like that, which I'm gonna argue, um, when you're putting lotions on someone's skin, when someone's skin is breaking down, you're just covering up. You did not fix those 10 defensive functions that we all need, and it's really critical. Um, do they demonstrate uh, systemic uh, absorption concerns? Uh, and I don't know how it is in the UK, uh, but you know we have concerns about if you're uh, breastfeeding or if you're pregnant. Um, but uh, we're finding out that uh, we have all these nurses that are putting it on 80 times a day, 
and they're getting pulled over for DUIs because they have alcohol in their blood content. So there's a huge absorption that can be really, really negative to us. And then finally, uh, resistance. You know, we're starting to, just like we have antibiotic uh, stewardship, we're starting to talk about antiseptic resistance. And what we're going to take you through here with the microbiome, and if you treat it properly, um, that resistance doesn't exist. Um, so this is uh, uh, what just came out from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines. And I'll just take you through quickly. Um, and what they do is they make uh, these recommendation guidelines. I don't want to take you through all of these. But it, it takes you through um, if there is good evidence for something, it gets what's called a Category 1A. It's a strong recommendation that supports what we're doing. Um, and we, we take it all the way down to where there's a Category 2 where it's a weak recommendation. And finally, where there is no recommendation, unresolved issue. And this is what came out uh, with this report, that the controlled trial evidence suggested that the trade-offs between the benefits and the harms uh, regarding um, the timing of preoperative showers uh, for preoperative bathing uh, with the use of chlorhexidine was not being shown to reduce surgical site infection. And I think what you, when I take you through what we're going to see today, you're going to understand why there isn't this correlation. You know, this is really challenging that idea that, well, if you just kill pathogens, you're going to improve infection. That is not true. So with that, I'm going to have Jack. Uh, Jack is our VP of um, National Accounts, and he, uh, I call him uh, Dr. Jack Payne. Um, he's, he's just fabulous about knowing uh, how the stratum corneum functions. Uh, he is his very, very close friend is Dr. Peter Elias, who is the one who really discovered this 40 years ago uh, at the University of California. He's been written up, if you ever want to look up his name. Uh, this has been uh, published over 600 times about how the stratum corneum works, its defensive functions, and the role that it can play in healthcare in general. Go ahead, Jack. Thanks, T. Um, and I am going to talk a lot about stratum corneum science here. I need some place to keep my cheeks. cheeks. Um, if any of you would like to take a deeper dive into this, there's a paper called The Skin Barrier as an Innate Immune Element. The Skin Barrier as an Innate Immune Element. Most of the next 10 minutes are going to come from that paper. It was written by Dr. Peter Elias. He's at the University of California, San Francisco. But when I talked to Peter about the fact that I was going to be over here, he said, you know, you really need to mention a couple of names to people from the UK because obviously there's been a lot of research about the stratum corneum. Uh, up till 55 years ago, dermatologists thought that the stratum corneum had no physiological function because of staining techniques that just looked like a dead matrix of uh, dead keratinocytes, enucleated keratinocytes that were in the process of being sloughed off. We've since this discovery has got tremendous physiological processes, and I'm going to talk about those. But there are a couple of people we want to be mentioned. Dr. Michael Cork, who's at the uh, University of Sheffield, has done great work on the stratum corneum. His whole team has. And also, the other person who he described as a titan, uh, he did mention, though, and I, this may have influenced that designation, that he had really only met him one time at a conference in the UK, and at that time, uh, Dr. Erwin McLean from the University of Dundee uh, gave Peter what he said was the best bottle of scotch he had ever had in his life. So that might have influenced his type designation. But in fact, Dr. McLean was the person that discovered the genetic mutation which causes the uh, filagrin production deficiency in those kids that have atopic dermatitis uh, during early, uh, early uh, life. And typically, at least 45% or so of them go on to develop both asthma, rhinitis, uh, serious so they call it the atopic march, and that was Dr. McLean's discovery, which now is resulting in tremendous research about how we might be able to address that situation. But, uh, okay, I'm going to advance this. Uh, Dr. Elias actually coined this term, bricks and mortar, which is generally the way people talk about the stratum corneum. Now it really relates to the structure, because what you have are uh, enucleated keratinocytes, which are called corneocytes. They go in. Okay, sorry about that. Is that better? I apologize. Uh, they uh, have become, starting to become cornified. 
They're bonded together with these little protein rivets called corneodesmosomes that have a really key role also in skin cohesion and integrity. We'll talk about that a little bit. And then they're surrounded by a lipid structure, uh, really three uh, types of lipids, uh, cholesterol, ceramides, and long-chain free fatty acids, which exist in almost an exact one-to-one -to -one to one molar ratio. And there's tremendous biochemistry going on within this lipid structure all the time. So uh, we'll move on. This is a little bit uh, better picture because it's an actual micrograph. And it's really not as, uh, as detailed as you can see on the picture on the computer. But what I do like about this is shows the uh, process of desquamation, the sloughing off of the skin at the top uh, of the stratum corneum. Uh, and of course, as you all know, this is something where everything in this diagram is constantly moving up. Keratinocytes are moving up, becoming corneocytes, and eventually being sloughed off. So we're replacing our skin layer on a regular basis, okay? Now, we discovered in the last 55 years, I say in the last 55 years because 55 years ago, as I said, people had no knowledge of the stratum corneum and thought it had no importance. And that was because we had very poor staining techniques. Once we learned how to stain a, a, a tissue that had lipids in it, we were able to start to see that there was something going on. I'm sorry this is cutting in and out, uh, but I'll keep going here. But anyway, all of these protective functions now we know are provided by the stratum corneum. I'm not gonna talk about any in detail other than the antimicrobial barrier, the acidic mantle of skin, because that what, that's what has the most impact on infection prevention. But I want to mention two more. One is the permeability barrier, because it's so important, particularly if you live in Phoenix in the summertime when it's 119 degrees and the humidity is 17%. Uh, if you didn't have a good permeability barrier protecting against normal osmotic processes, you would desiccate and die pretty quickly. Uh, and that's the truth. So uh, that really is dependent on the lip structure. We'll talk a lot about the lip structure. And the other one that's interesting, as we all work in a situation with patients who under, in many instances, are under tremendous psychological stress, which uh, results in the production of uh, corticosteroids in the stratum corneum, uh, and there are real protections in the stratum corneum. That can result in a rise in pH, and all the negative things that you can see when pH goes up. So, uh, but I'm gonna focus on the one in red. Uh, the healthy stratum corneum is at a, a really low pH uh, between the age of three months and uh, about 50 years. That pH is normally below five. And as you know, that's a logarithmic scale. So if you're at 4.9, your pH is more than 100 times more acidic than neutral. And that's where it's supposed to be. That's the basal condition for the, for the stratum corneum. Uh, there are a lot of factors that influence that. Age is one. Steve's going to talk a little bit more uh, about that. Uh, your environment, uh, the humidity impacted, uh, various disease conditions. A lot of things can impact that, but in healthy conditions, it's all it's going to be uh, for someone in early to middle age, it's going to be under five. And now I'm going to talk about the three type of protections against infection that the healthy stratum corneum at that nominal low pH condition provides. And the first of those, and this is really breaking up, I apologize. The first of those is a, a structural protection. And quite simply, if you look at the next slide, you will see that this is a pretty formidable wall. Now, the average distance in total depth of the stratum corneum is about 30 microns, 30 millionths of a meter. So when you think about all the things I'm gonna be talking about here that provide antimicrobial protection to the body. It's amazing that it occurs in a tissue that's that thin. But if but think about this bricks and mortar structure. If you're a Staph aureus bacterium trying to penetrate this, you've got to go through this really soupy, thick lipid structure. And by the way, it contains a lot of things that are going to try to kill you. We'll get into that in just a moment. But you've also, it's almost impossible that they go through these these envelopes, these corneocytes that have become, become, become harder, even though they're still moisturized, they also have a really significant physical uh, barrier. Let's look at the environmental protections that are present in this tissue. 
okay? As I said, the normal stratum corneum, uh, 4.5 to 5.5, because I'm 68 years old, my stratum corneum is no longer at 5, it's higher than that. My skin's getting thicker, uh, my lipid contact is, being, is becoming less, uh, but still it's relatively low. And in this low pH environment, and this is something that Steve's going to elaborate a little, on a little bit more as it relates to the microbiome, but normal, healthy flora grows very well in a low pH environment. I'm talking about more unsophisticated gram-positive bacteria, yeast, fungus, viruses, little bitty mites, tiny little spiders. 25% of our total body mass, as you know, are things that are not human cells that live in, in us and on us uh, that are kind of along for the ride. And we're really making significant uh, strides in beginning to understand the impact of all of the microbiome in our body. Uh, as you know, you probably read, we now know there's a direct connection between our gut microbiome and the development of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. And those sorts of discoveries are really being made on a continual basis. Companies are springing up all over the world to really start working on bio, microbiome therapies. So this is something you're gonna hear more and more about over the next five or 10 years. These healthy, the healthy microbiome, uh, they produce acidic metabolites, which kind of reinforces their own existence. It helps preserve that low pH environment. Some of them produce antimicrobial substances, including penicillin is produced in minute qualities by some of the mold that exists as normal uh, micro, you know, microbiome on your skin. So it's really uh, a fascinating process. And there's one more I wanted to mention, Steve, before I move on. And that is that if you look at a specific organism, it can be sometimes healthy and sometimes pathogenic. The best example is uh, Staph epidermidis. Um, many of you probably deal with this organism, particularly if you work in, in a neonatal unit. It's one of the two leading causes of uh, neonatal sepsis. It can be very opportunistic in that population. And one of the reasons it's opportunistic is because the pH of those neonates is close to neutral. In fact, if they are very, bir uh, very uh, low birth weight neonates, it can be even basic. And staph uh, epidermidis can grow very well in that environment. Also, as you know, it's very key in the infections for indwelling medical devices. It can cause biofilms. Uh, anytime you puncture the skin, you get a rise in pH. It allows staph epidermis to go from being a good uh, bacteria, or a good bacterium to a bad bacterium. And I would hazard a guess that everyone in this room has staph epidermis as part of their bi microbiome right now. It's very, very, very prevalent. Now, on the other hand, staph epidermis is now known to produce a Phenol soluble modulin, a specific chemical which has targeted antimicrobial activity against Staph aureus. So it's part of the body's natural defense system against Staph aureus, and, and yet in itself, in a higher pH environment, it can become pathogenic. So all of this whole thing relating to the microbiome is really increasingly complicated. And lastly, in terms of the biochemical protect, uh, protections. There are a number of substances that exist primarily in the intercellular spaces between the corneocytes, which are very antimicrobial. Uh, in the paper I mentioned, Dr. Elias's paper, uh, about uh, you know the skin barrier as an innate immune element, there's a great micrograph of a, uh, of a, a long chain free fatty acid enveloping a single staph aureus bacterium within the interior in, in, intercellular space and surrounding that so that, that that bacterium cannot undergo any sort of respiration, mitosis, and basically killing that bacterium within the intercellular space. There are also, and these are particularly present whenever there is insult or injury uh, to the surface of the skin, uh, little bitty manufacturing organelles down at the interface of the stratum corneum and the stratum granulosum that are call, called lamellar bodies. Uh, they're responsible for producing the lipids that come up and form the lamellar bilayers, the lipid structure of the stratum corneum. 
They also produce antimicrobial peptides. They produce about 40 different antimicrobial peptides of about seven or eight different types. All of these have antimicrobial action as long as they're in that healthy, low pH environment because the production of those down in the lamellar bodies is also dependent upon enzymes, which are pH dependent. So again, we get back to maintaining that natural, normal, low pH condition of the skin. What's the first thing we do when we put people in hospitals? We start bathing them with high pH soap and water. We're really defeating the body's natural protection when we do that. We're raising the pH, which is really going to create problems. And uh, lastly, there's an amino alcohol called spingicine, which is a metabolite of phengolipids, which is also antimicrobial. So there's a lot of antimicrobial activity and substances in the intercellular spaces, which are extremely effective against all sorts of pathogens. All right, Steve, I think that's about it. And I'm going to turn this back over to Steve. He's going to hopefully make this microphone work better than I did and talk about the, uh, the uh, microbiome more. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that by just passing that on and just choosing this one. Um, now you know why I call him doctor, uh, Dr. Payne. Uh, so here's the interesting thing. I've been to Stanford, UCLA, University of Louisville. We've really been looking at this issue of the microbiome. And um, we are on the just, if this was a baseball game, uh, I'd say cricket here, wouldn't I? Okay. <laughs> if this is a baseball game, we're just at the first batter. Uh, because one of the things we don't know is we don't know what a good microbiome is. We have discovered to this point to what we've been doing is a good microbiome is your microbiome. The problem is your microbiome is in dysbiosis. It's become unbalanced, either by age, by events going on in our lives, it's that patient in, in ICU. And so what we're really trying to do is how do we manage that better? And I'm gonna take you through that of what we talk about host immunity. So there's four elements to managing the microbiome. Um, and this is where uh, we really haven't thought this through when you look at topical antiseptics. Um, microbial load, yes, uh, our product uh, does decrease um, the, the overall microbial load. But we don't want to decrease it too much because there's a lot of good flora in there, right? Where it'd be the same thing as taking all the trees down in the Congo and then turn around and going, well, what happened to the Congo? Well, we do that every day in our healthcare facilities. So what we want to do is we want to lower the microbial load. And then we want to um, create an environment that these pathogens don't want to flourish at. So what's amazing, when we talked about resistance, MRSA, VRE, Pseudomonas, and all those things, they flourish at neutral at 7. They, don't, they won't flourish in an acidic world of 5. So if we could actually lower the microbial load and we could lower your pH, when you look at alcohols and chlorhexidines and those types of things, really what they do is they create so much disruption that they make the pH go up and the natural antimicrobial peptides and the fatty free acids don't get produced anymore. So when we put it on, we just made you worse. We did kill organisms, but we made you worse. So we want to make it to where the pathogens won't grow, and then we want your natural flora to grow. Remember he's talked about, for your natural flora to grow, it's got to grow around 5, 5.2. So in that acidic environment, we can rebalance your flora. And repeated treatments, what am I doing? Every time I, I do a repeated treatment on you, which is um, could be every six hours, could be Q6, Q12. Well, every time, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to getting your microbiome where it needs to be. And finally, the most important part, he talked about there was 40. There are 40 of these antimicrobial peptides that cover a whole host, right? Some are for gram negative, some are for gram positive, um, yeast and fungi. Your body has this incredible body armor that we're destroying. And you need all of these components, all four of these elements to start to come together to really be successful. So we'll talk about how that really works and what that looks like. Um, the top graph shows what happens in a traditional antiseptic approach and when we continually use it. What you're going to see is the pH of the colonization is going down. Uh, you're killing off your natural flora with the topical antiseptic, but you're also actually you thought you were killing pathogens you are actually increasing it. I had a patient at Walter Reed. Uh, it was a soldier that came back from Iraq, and he had an uh, organism, it was a gram-negative organism. They didn't know what happened, and they were decolonizing with chlorhexidine. They called us in after two weeks. After two weeks, the organism, uh, the gram-negative organism was all over his body, and his natural flora had been depleted. It took us about two more weeks 
to getting to where his natural flora grew back. Of course, we took care of the gram-negative bacteria, and now all of the military hospitals in the United States use our technology for this very reason. So what happens is you're actually getting this patient in a worse condition. But what happens if we try to balance your defensive functions? So what we're going to do is we're going to lower those pathogens both by we want to kill some pathogens, obviously, but we want to create an environment where they don't grow, they can't grow. And then the natural flora is going to do very well, and it's going to push out any opportunities for your pathogens to where you're getting over here where you get into a really good, balanced, defensive microbiome. And that's how we are starting to achieve. When you look at what we're achieving with urinary tract infections, we're reducing those from anywhere from 80 to 100 percent in patients in ICUs all over the United States. Um, we can get up to 70 percent, if there's some people in here in long-term care, uh, up to 70 percent reduction of just incontinent UTIs in a long-term care setting. But it's all because of what the two different looks of what we're doing here. Um, so Jack alluded to this. This is really the issue, is your pH today is not what your pH is going to be tomorrow. So he talked about when an infant's born, and they're born around 6.5, and uh, in the United States, I don't know how they do here, the first thing we do is we use a, a, a body wash that usually has alkaline soaps of around 13. I've got six kids, and all of them have done the same thing. Uh, I wish I would have known about this. But we, our kids are so susceptible in here while they're trying to get their acidic mantle going and some of these natural animal microbial peptides um, that are going. And then as we become adults, assuming you don't have stress in your life, and I'm sure none of you all have stress in your life, uh, <laughs> Uh, that things happen in here. I'm 55, um, and as he said, uh, my skin starts getting thinner. I'm not creating the same uh, peptides. My pH is getting higher. Uh, those rivets that hold my skin together, I'm starting to slough them off. So an 88-year-old woman in ICU or 88-year-old woman in long-term care who's incontinent, her situation is completely different than the 35-year-old guy who just had a motorcycle accident. Now, they might both be in ICU, but they're completely different. Um, and so these therapies have to take into account this life, this lifespan of what's going on with your skin and your defensive mechanisms. And up until now, no one's really ever looked at that. So here's what's exciting, um, the future and where we're going with, with our company. Um, we envision being able to eventually customize. We, we talked about what's a good microbiome. I'm telling you, we just, we, we, no one knows. Your microbiome and your defensive mechanisms are so much more complex than we ever knew. And science is now showing us that. Uh, so we're starting to study and look at uh, creating customized to specific microbiomes. Like your microbiome, I don't know the UK that well, so um, let's just say that you were in a wet environment or you were in a, a, hot, um, a hot, dry environment. Your microbiomes are going to look cons considerably different. Uh, women. Uh, one of the reasons why you struggle with UTIs is that you sweat more neutral at 7. Uh, I sweat more acidic at 5.3, 5.6. There's a lot of reasons for that, but that's just a, So your defensive makeup is going to look different, male to female, uh, what age you are, where you're from, what your natural flora growth pattern looks like, um, and then even uh, specific disease disruptions, like if you had a cancer. Let's just say you had breast cancer. Your microbiome in that, because you're going to, what's happening is, and we have this happen right now, we're doing a study at Brown University um, where we're looking at patients that are undergoing chemotherapy and what's happening to their microbiome. We know we're reestablishing it, but we're trying to figure out the science of it, uh, but we're still early on in that. So the future is going to be really exciting from that perspective. Uh, today, we have um, been blessed, to be honest with you, to be able to have the breakthroughs that we've had, uh, that we're getting this 80 to 100 percent reduction of UTIs, uh, or what we're doing with uh, total body decolonization in an ICU. Um, I think we're probably 80 percent there, but there's another 20 percent that I think is going to be really, really unique to what we do. And so what we're getting is this incredible efficacy, um, but we have this unparalleled, unparalleled biocompatibility, the safety. You see now with the science that we're doing, it necessarily has to be safe, right? If I'm going to work with your body to help it defend organisms, I absolutely have to be safe. But I can get these huge, huge benefits. And I think what I'm going to do is, Jack, I think you're going to share 
a little bit about the clinical evidence that we have going on in the United States. We're going to go through these studies pretty quickly, uh, but I want to tell you that uh, if you come by our booth, and some of you already have, and you know that we've got about 30 clinical studies now available, and uh, I'm only going to talk about three or four that were selected by our senior VP of sales. I would have picked a couple others, but he's in charge of this part, so he got to pick those. But I want to uh, let you know all of those are on a USB drive that we will give you at our booth so you can go home and read these at your leisure without having to take a whole bunch of paper home. But these are all done in the U.S., but most of them have pretty decent controls. They vary in terms of quality, but overall, it'll give you a sense for the plethora of clinical data that we now have on the outcomes that have been produced with our products. But as Steve was saying, it, we want to. What if you had a, a product that could create, you know, uh, efficacy, potency, uh, say equal to chlorhexidine to gluconate, but it would also be non-cytotoxic, skin friendly, and biocompatible? Would that be of advantage to you? I think it, it would be. So we're going to talk about a few studies here that we've done so that we can begin to demonstrate that to our customers in the U.S. The first of these was published in the American Journal of Infection Control, which is our premier infection control journal in the States. And so we're really pleased to have this. It's gotten us a lot of play. It was about the efficacy of our uh, skin, uh, this novel skin antiseptic against uh, carbapenem-resistant uh, Enterobacteria, uh, which of course is a huge problem, a very difficult uh, bug. We looked at both the, the Klebsiella and the E. coli strains. And uh, now I'd like you to read the first line. No, I'm just kidding. It's a vision test. We're going to move on to the next because I tried to make this a little bit larger. And you can see the conclusion was essentially that this was a product they call a silver base. We hate that. We have really about maybe a half a percent of colloidal silver in our product, which is really a preservative. It helps obviously provides a little biocidal activity, but it's not the key to our success, but a lot of people kind of key in on that and talk about us as a silver-based product. Disturbs us a little bit, but overall our formula works, so we're not going to argue with it. But we did demonstrate good effectiveness against a very difficult organism. So moving on, the next thing is if we can be effective uh, against, uh, you know, against uh, VRE and CRE, and by the way, this has a lot of other testing that we've done uh, in vitro. That was done on a skin analog, by the way, so it's really uh, in, in vitro testing. Uh, but we've got a lot of other in vitro testing showing our effectiveness against various organisms on this little USB drive. Then we looked at how about cytotoxicity. Well, we know we really enhance the stratum corneum, but what if we were also able to prove uh, non-toxicity and cytotoxicity, uh, non-cytotoxicity in mucosal tissue? Because we like to say, and we are a mucous membrane safe product, but we want to be able to demonstrate how mucous membrane safe we are. And the other thing is, you know, what if we could demonstrate that by using our product you don't see the transepidermal water loss and drying and loss of moisture content in the skin that you typically see with chlorhexidine. We go to the APIC convention every year. Everyone uses chlorhexidine gluconate. None of the clinicians we don't talk to like it because of what it does to their patients. They get so many complaints and some patients just basically end up refusing it. So I guarantee you with our product you don't see any of that. The staff loves our product. Let's look at these in reverse order in terms of the results that were achieved. This, is, this was a very sophisticated statistical analysis. They did two tests. They did one test using three different instruments, which looked at water content and transepidermal wall loss, and then looked also at a visual observation with twice a day applications over five days to see if they could see any dryness or erythema. That's obviously a very subjective evaluation. We demonstrated uh, improvement. Go to the next slide, Steve, because I think it's going to be this a little bit better. Okay. You know, this is kind of the protocol for the test. It was a forearm controlled twice a day application of both chlorhexidine 4% in our product. And go to the next slide. And what they determined was even though we showed better numbers, and we, you can look at the whole study on this thing, we didn't do so in a statistically significant enough way to, to say that we were superior to chlorhexidine including the visual examination. So they called us, they gave us a non-inferiority score there, which is really fine for us. As long as we have non-inferiority, we do really well because we're also less expensive than chlorhexidine gluconate. But in the area which just looked at the scientific instruments that were used to measure TEWL, transepidermal water loss, moisture content of the skin, they said that we statistically demonstrated superiority to chlorhexidine gluconate. I can tell you anecdotally, 
everyone that uses our product is thrilled with the fact that it really maintains a better skin quality in those patients that are being bathed on a repeated basis with it. Let's look at the next one. So um, this is the one where I talked about we decided we were going to take a look at our uh, cytotoxicity in mucosal tissue, and here are the results down here. This was the hours of pretty much continuous contact with both of these substances on actual tissue before they began to see a cytotoxic response uh, with 4% chlorhexidine in the airway mucosa. Uh, that occurred in 0.05 hours. What is that? Uh, one twentieth of an hour would be, what, three minutes. In our product, it took 5.7 hours. In gingival tissue, uh, after 8.86 hours, 4% began to show a cytotoxic uh, response. Ours was 400 hours. Uh, in intestinal tissue, 1.42 to 56 hours. And in uh, vaginal tissue, it was 6.16 to 34 0.19 hours. So we're not only more safer and produce less drying and trans epidermal water loss in the stratum corneum, the surface of the skin, but also even in mucosal tissue, we've been able to show a much higher degree of safety. Uh, and based on those were two studies that had a real impact on something I want to mention real quickly and leave time for questions, and that is Vizian is the largest health performance company in the United States. There are 32 hospitals out of our 6,000 now that are members of this organization. This is a combination of two organizations called Novation and Med Assets that recently occurred. But based on uh, these results and our attendance at their Innovative Technology Forum in the fall, we received Innovative Technology designation and received a no-bid contract. So we now have access to these 3,200 hospitals as a contracted Innovative Technology vendor. Uh, in next month, we're going to the nursing committee at Premier, which is the second largest of these types of companies in our country. Uh, to see whether they're going to agree to provide us a no-bid uh, innovative technology contract. We have a high degree of, of um, uh, confidence that that's going to occur, and that'll bring, leave us one more. They're a little bit tougher to knock on the door, but we'll get there with them as well. This is kind of, this is really a fun one. This is our, our major randomized controlled trial that's going on. A little history. This is St. Jude uh, Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, which you probably are aware of. Danny Thomas's uh, originally founded the hospital. No patient in the hospital pays for care. It's all done on a uh, free basis. They're the most heavily endowed hospital in the United States. They do incredible things for kids, primarily with cancer. And this study is being done right now in their hemopoietic stem cell transplant unit. 70% of the kids that they treat in this area get some degree of graft versus host disease. As you know, that disease manifests itself. If it's going to manifest itself, it, all, it manifests usually first on the skin with skin issues. So, and that leads to infections. And they were having a tremendous problem with all sorts of different infections. Uh, they had used their works and were familiar with it, but they had one patient who had a uh, resistant pseudomonas infection that they were really struggling with. They decided to try their works. They were able to eradicate the infection with no recurrence in about two weeks. And so they decided to do a full-blown randomized control trial. There are 132 patients into a 200-patient study now. We won't know for sure until they open the envelopes, but they've seen a nice enough reduction in their overall infection rates that they're pretty sure it's because half of these kids are getting TheraWorks. And uh, they have, feel so confident in this that they have recently decided to implement the use of TheraWorks in the perineum, where, of course, because we're mucous membrane safe, it's okay to use for all of their patients who have a, a Foley catheter to prevent Foley infections. We got another meta-analysis of 10 hospitals comparing uh, not using TheraWorks for an average of 20 months to using TheraWorks after implementation for an average of 15 months, where we show in those 10 hospitals a, a mean reduction in CAUTI rates of 54% which is really good because we're still struggling with CAUTI in the states just like you are. It's the toughest one to get at. And because we are non-cytotoxic, mucous membrane safe, tough area to keep the skin pH low, but we can do it. And that's one of the reasons we're really so successful. So just to bring that all together, um, four takeaways, right? Our past approaches, maybe we didn't really completely think through. Um, emerging science was overlooked. And um, you know some companies like ours, and there's others, they're starting to look at, uh, you know, really how can we optimize the microbiome, uh, the stratum corneum and its functions. Um, understanding the role of how diverse this is, every time we look at it, it gets more and more complex. So um, you're going to see a lot of science come out of that. And then ultimately, I want you to take away, 
the patient's immunity is absolutely critical to reducing infections. There's no getting around that. And so when we think about things, that's why we always ask people, um, are your therapies microbiome compliant? Have you considered the role of, of your patient's immunity? And what are you doing about the immune health in your, uh, in your facilities? Um, and with that, I say thanks from the Yanks. Thank you.